Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's time for us to have some uncomfortable conversations. You heard that recently? That it's time for us to discuss things that can be difficult, like racism, prejudice, privilege, injustice, brutality, this kind of stuff. It's time for us to be open and honest, for us to acknowledge and admit things that we've done wrong, for us to realize that sometimes we do things that hurt others without even knowing it. With all the tension, with all the unrest going on throughout our nation, these are some of the encouragements that are kind of making the rounds lately. And they're not bad, right? You, you realize that. It's, it's not a bad thing for us to be open and honest with ourselves. It's not a bad thing for us to acknowledge that we always have not followed God's path the way he wants us to. It's okay for us to admit that sometimes we struggle with our thoughts, with our words. They're not always the nicest. It's okay for us to listen to people, really compassionately listen to people who do not have the same experience as you might. It's okay. But those kinds of conversations, those kinds of thoughts undoubtedly get a little uncomfortable for us because who wants to admit that they've been wrong or ignorant before? Who wants to admit that? Anybody? Who wants to openly and honestly say, yeah, I've done some things that I'm not proud of and here's what they are? Who wants to say, maybe, maybe there have been times in my life where I've been part of a problem rather than part of helping others? Who wants to bring that kind of darkness to light? Anybody? The Apostle Paul sure does. <laughs> In this reading from 1 Timothy, he is sure open and honest, right? He says, I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. He is open and he is willing to say, these are the things I've done. Blasphemer, that that means he wasn't just kind of doing it every once in a while, but he characterizes himself, that's what I was. I was the type of person who was, oh, so happy to be demeaning and degrading towards someone who wasn't like me. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I was the kind who, if you didn't have the same kind of ideas, you didn't have the same kind of beliefs as me, well, then I was going to try and make your life more difficult. Not just with the words that he said. It wasn't just that he wanted to say shameful and spiteful things to people. But he also was pretty aggressive about trying to track people down and harass them vehemently. Elsewhere in the Bible, Paul even admits that if you're a Christian, his obsession was to try and seek you out and get you either thrown in prison, beaten, or killed. That's the guy who wrote these words in 1 Timothy, part of the Bible. He says that at that point in his life, he was living in unbelief. He was being ignorant. He, he just could not understand why anyone would ever want to believe in Jesus. Because Jesus was the problem. Jesus was the enemy. And all of Jesus' followers, they were all trying to get rid of the Jewish way of life and the Jewish doctrine. Paul could not understand that. He said, this is a good thing. I like this. This is what I learned. This is what I love. And this gospel message of Jesus, this is in complete contrast to the things that I know and love. How could anybody? I mean, if you want to be a child of God, Paul thought it was pretty simple. Do what your daddy did. Follow the father's. Listen to the traditions. Do the works of the law. Stay away from outsiders and foreigners and pagans. Disassociate yourself from anybody who is trying to change things or be difficult or be different. In other words, what could we call Paul? Prejudice against anyone who didn't have his ideas, about people who didn't have his experience? 
seeking out his own form of justice on these people who were different than him? You know, when I read through any section in the Bible that includes people like this, you know what I'm tempted to think? Whew, I'm glad I'm not like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's, there's been too many times in my life where my heart's been filled with a little arrogance, pride, self-righteousness. Like, I'm pretty good. But I never made it my mission in life, like Paul, to blaspheme, to degrade, to, to, to hate people, to put others down. Whew, how could anyone be like that? And yeah, I know, I'll admit it, I've had violence and I've had rage in my heart and even in high school and college in a dorm with buddies, sometimes that comes out. But never, ever, have I ever put anybody in the hospital or in their grave I don't know how somebody like Paul could carry around that kind of guilt in life. How could he? I mean, it's almost, right, it's almost a little uncomfortable to listen to Paul say those kinds of things or, or to talk to anybody who kind of says that, that that's kind of what their life was like. How could anyone have that kind of contempt in their heart? That's what I'm tempted to, to think sometimes when I read sections like this. But do you notice what that's doing? I'm putting myself up here, and I'm putting people like Paul down here. I'm saying, oh, I could never be like that. I mean, I've got good morals and a decent character. I would never. How could Paul? When you read sections about Moses and how he killed a guy and Matthew and how he was a greedy tax collector and Paul, how he was a violent man, when you, when you read these kinds of sections in the Bible, we are tempted to say, thank God I am not like other people. And that just proves, it just proves that we're being self-righteous and arrogant. That we're putting ourselves up here and others down here. It just proves that we are trying to get comfortable with our problems, with our sinful self. Paul's not doing that here. He shows us a good example of how to just be open and honest. He's not making excuses. He's not saying, well, it was my upbringing. It was the family that I was raised in. It was my schooling. It was the culture. No, none of that. He just openly and honestly admits, this is what I once was. And he doesn't just keep it in the past tense. Did you notice that? Certainly he says, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor. That's past tense. But he also, in verse 15 and 16, he does say, of whom I am the worst. Not I was the worst, I am the worst. And in me, the worst of sinners. Paul's saying this isn't just something that he had to outgrow. Or something that he had to do a little bit of listening and a little bit of learning, a little research, so that he could kind of pass it by and get rid of that part of his life. No, Paul is saying it's still a condition that he struggles with right now. And that's pretty uncomfortable to hear. It's uncomfortable because it means the issue is a little bit deeper than upbringing or culture means the issue is a little bit deeper than the family that he has. Hearing that Paul says, I am the worst in the present tense, even though he's speaking as a missionary who is preaching the gospel and is willing to take any kind of suffering and pain for Jesus. Hearing him say, I am the worst, means that the condition is one in the heart. It means it's a condition that you and I have too means you and I have to confess the same uncomfortable things that Paul confesses. That our hearts are not clean and pure. That the heart we have, it's not just sometimes that it goes off base and makes some really bonehead decisions or makes some sloppy mistakes, but that our heart, the human heart that each one of us is born with, is completely hostile and opposed to God and others. That the heart we're born with is, is evil and shameful and destructive. And that's uncomfortable to talk about. 
But sometimes people find ways to deal with that kind of uncomfortable sensation that they have when they start to realize. What, what people try to do is to confess as little as possible. You ever been like that? Where you just try to say, oh, yeah, that's, that's in the past. Let's not talk about that. Or you been the type of person who says, no, you just deny it, or you ignore it, or you try to make up for it, you know, two, two rights undo a wrong or something like that. You try to make yourself feel better, or what we all like to do sometimes is point out other problems in other people that are far worse than our own. That's how we try to deal with it. But you understand that that's just trying to get comfortable with your own sin. It's just trying to make yourself feel better so you can look yourself in the mirror every night. It doesn't actually do anything about the sinful heart that you have. Sure, I'm sure it's true that that enough studying and learning and listening to others, you can probably get rid of some of the symptoms of sin, right? Like a symptom of racism. If you talk to enough people, if you research, and you can probably stop a little bit of racism in your heart, or ignorance, or prejudice, or pride, but you can't get rid of that sinful heart that you were born with. You're only just trying to cover it up with something that's not going to work. See, the thing about sin is it has to be dealt with. We can't just sweep it under a rug and get comfortable with the fact that that's kind of in the past in my life. We can't just leave skeletons in the closet. If, if you want to be a part of God's people, if you want to have a place with this king that seems to be pretty impressive, immortal, invisible, eternal. If you want to have a place in his home, eternally, then you have to meet his standard. You can't do it your way. You can't leave the things swept under the rug or skeletons in the closet. You can't try to get comfortable with your sin because sin is unacceptable and it's uncomfortable to God. God says you have to meet his standard. You have to be perfect in every way. As much as we might try to get comfortable with the problems in our life and the pain that we have caused, that's not going to work with God. We're still going to be left in our sin. We're still going to be left in that very uncomfortable situation. We might try to get comfortable with it. We might try to be okay. We might try to confess some things and hide others, deny others, but... You know, there's one person who's not comfortable with this. God. God's not comfortable with the way you and I are and the sinful heart that we are born with and the sinful thoughts that go on in our head and the sinful words that come out of our mouth and the sinful actions that we do with our hands. God's not comfortable with it. And that kind of leads to the second uncomfortable part of this text. See, the first part is Paul being so open and honest, showing us this is the kind of condition that we all have, and it's a little scary. But the other uncomfortable part of this text is seeing God's mercy. See, for someone like the Apostle Paul, blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, someone who is actively and willingly trying to kill other people, Seeing somebody like Moses, no, yeah, great prophet, led God's people out of Egypt, but the only reason he was called by this burning bush is because he was out of Egypt because he had murdered a guy. Seeing someone like Matthew, the, the only reason that God would come for someone like you and me is because he loved us that much. Like for people like you and me, for the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ came into the world. He didn't come because we were trying hard. He didn't come because we were getting comfortable. He didn't come because we were doing the work. We were listening, we were learning, we were really working hard. No, he came because sin is so unacceptable and uncomfortable to God. He came because God knows that with our sinful condition and our sinful hearts, we would never be able to get rid of our problems and pain. He came because God 
was willing to do it. To do what we could not and what we would not. God was willing to step in and save us from this rotten, uncomfortable situation. He was willing to do it all. And he was willing to do it for all. And that kind of mercy, it it goes beyond what I'm comfortable with. This past uh, week I watched, I finished watching this um, documentary on Lance Armstrong. Anybody remember Lance Armstrong? Seven Tour de France's in a row, or Tour de France, whatever he wants to say. You know, Lance is still pretty okay with the whole situation. He said in this interview, I wouldn't change a thing because it's the man I am now today. It's like tougher, stronger. You kind of watch this whole documentary and you start to get introduced to a guy who doesn't really look all that sorry. He's kind of more irritated that he's the one who got caught when everybody else was doing it. That, and it may be true. I think it is true. That kind of era in baseball and in cycling, everything, it was just all about doping and performance-enhancing drugs. But it's kind of hard for us to be merciful to somebody who doesn't have any contrition, doesn't have any sorrow, doesn't try to make it right. It's kind of hard for us to be merciful to somebody like that, right? That's not God's mercy. It goes beyond what I'm comfortable with. It goes to people like you and me who don't deserve a thing from him. God's mercy says that all of our sins are taken care of, that there is not one single sin that Jesus did not die for. Paul says, hey, I'm the worst of sinners. It's my condition right now. That means there are no categories, there are no levels. We are all in that same boat. We all have to get comfortable confessing the same things about our thoughts, our words, and our actions, that we have been opposed to God. We have been hostile, and we have been violent, and we have been blasphemers. And those are the very people that God shows his mercy to. Mercy that allows us to say, just like the Apostle Paul, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. God's mercy looks at you and allows you to say, I don't have to be afraid of death. How about that? When you see that happening in the world all around, I don't have to be afraid of it because my Lord and Savior already took that for me. God's mercy allows you and I to say, I don't have to be afraid of hell. Jesus took the full wrath of God. All of the wrath was poured out onto Jesus so that it would never be poured out onto you and me. Faith in Jesus, we have his victory. Remember what he did after he rose from the dead? We're going to say it in a couple minutes in the Apostles' Creed. He rose from the dead. He descended into hell. That wasn't to suffer more. Did you know that? That was to proclaim victory. That was to go down to hell, to the devil's playground, and say, you're a loser and you always will be. That's what you and I get to say by God's grace. His mercy allows us to say to the devil, you don't get to bring up those past sins You don't get to make me feel guilty because Jesus has removed the guilt as far as the east is from the west. God's mercy allows us to say, I am the worst. The worst for whom Christ died. The worst who gets to live forever with that king who is immortal and eternal and invisible, the only God. Paul wants to make this point abundantly clear. And so he says this, The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Not just a little bit. Not just enough. But abundantly. Elsewhere, maybe you remember Psalm 23, my cup overflows. God's grace doesn't do just enough to get you by. He gives you abundant. He gives you more and more and more. So that every single day, when you go to bed at night feeling a little guilty, when you wake up in the morning thinking, is this going to be the same thing? You get to say, what God's mercy says. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, including me. I like how Paul uses the past tense to say that he has God's mercy. I was shown mercy. He says it twice. I was shown mercy. It's nothing about Paul. Paul is not the main character here. The main character is a God who loved him and saved him from his sins and gave him a new calling to 
to serve the Lord in faith and in hope and in joy. And that's what you and I have. We're not the main character. The Lord is the one who showed his mercy to us and called us by name and made us his children and put us into his service. It's the Lord who has accomplished it on our behalf. This example of Paul is a good one for us because we can see how amazing and how almost, you could say, uncomfortable God's mercy is. And that's what Paul says. He says, For this very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me the worst sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Example of Paul, the example of Moses, the example of Matthew, the example of me. It's to show us our Savior, how patient and loving he is with us. We have the same one as Paul, who looks at our sins, sees how uncomfortable they are, and then removes them from our record. And then puts us into his service and gives us his grace so that we can serve him faithfully. I think, it, I think it's right. I think Paul's right. It's time for us to go beyond maybe our comfort zone. Beyond the conversations that we're comfortable with. It's time for us to admit that our sinful heart is not good for us. That any sins that we kind of don't confess or that we try to cover up, they're not good for us. They're only hurting us. It's time for us to to see God's mercy. That though we were the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus came into the world to save us. This message of mercy, it's really the only thing that can make you and I comfortable in life. And it's the only message that will ever give us comfort that lasts for eternity. To God be the glory. Amen.